This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior's pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll see me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Good evening. Welcome to Northwood Baptist Church. Looking forward to a good evening in the Lord as we open up the Word of God to hear from Him. And uh, we want to ask the Lord to bless the service this evening as well as to continue to bless our membership and the missionaries that are uh, serving the Lord faithfully, that God would provide for them and that He would uh, build His church. So let's take a moment and ask the Lord to, to bless as we get started to worship Him tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. Again, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your house as your people. We ask, Lord, that you would guide the service with your Holy Spirit, that it would honor and glorify you. And Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you and strengthened in the faith and grace that you've given to us to walk in. And uh, again, Lord, that you would be glorified in our lives, blessed, and that you would build Northwood Baptist Church and all your churches tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you this evening over to the book of Acts chapter uh, 11, Acts chapter 11, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18, so I'll give you a moment to turn over there, Acts chapter 11, verse 18, and it reads this way, it says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And so let's take another moment here and ask the Lord to bless his word. Heavenly Father, again, we come before your throne. We ask your blessings on the word tonight and, uh, and on those that are in our membership that uh, need healing and, and health needs, Lord, that you would grant them. And then, Lord, that you would continue to bless our missionaries as they are serving you, that you would provide for them and Give the assurance that you're in control. And again, Lord, that you would build Northwood Baptist Church and all your churches tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look to this portion of Scripture tonight, the title of the message is Being Led by the Holy Spirit. Being Led by the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to share some thoughts with you concerning that subject matter. Uh, there's many messages that could be preached on that, and there are many truths that are involved in helping us to understand. So this is not the one and only answer or message to, to this subject matter. I believe it's a lifelong uh, study. And not only that, but it, because God is infinite and eternal, uh, it, it, it's just going to spill over all the way into eternity. And so we'll still continue to learn about the Lord uh, concerning His grace and power that He has given to us in our lives. So as we look at this, I want to ask you a question, being led by the Holy Spirit, what does that mean to you? And then let me ask you this also, what does that mean to the Lord? There are two, there may be two different definitions there or answers to that question. And tonight we want to look at what it, what it means by the Word of God to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you this question, um, what does that involve concerning you personally? Uh, is that something that we can do as individuals? Well, we know that that's what the Lord wants us to do as individuals and as a body of believers. So what will that require tonight? Well, it will, it will require a willingness 
to follow the Lord, which means, in turn, it equates to abiding in Christ. And so walking with God uh, in, in the Holy Spirit ought to be a fluid process. And the reason why it's a fluid process or should be a fluid process is because as we walk with the Lord, God will reveal truth that we were not ready for previously. As we grow in His grace, God begins to do a work in our life to conform us and to transform us into His likeness. So we'll look at the process of spiritual growth and, uh, and, and the Lord will reveal some interesting truths. And as we look to this text here, we'll find that Peter was serving the Lord and he had uh, the Lord doing things in his life as well. And they had this idea because salvation is of the Jews. The first believers were all Jewish people. And now all of a sudden, and the Lord is starting to work with in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and uh, the Lord was speaking with him, and he's opening up the gospel to the Gentiles, and, he, and he's telling him to go ahead and call, about, call on Peter. Peter's going to uh, give, uh, give him some instruction and, and help him in his walk with the Lord and to be a blessing to him. And so uh, the, the, the Lord is dealing with Peter as well. And so he gets this message that he's supposed to go to Cornelius, and the Lord's speaking with him, and and uh, this is all foreign to him and new. And so the Lord gives him a vision of all these unclean animals to eat. And he drops down the, uh, the, the blanket here and tells him to, to rise and eat. And Peter says, oh, look, no, no, no unclean thing is going to touch my, my lips. He's, he's got a zeal for the Lord. And yet the Lord is instructing him to do that. And then the Lord tells him, anything that I've called clean, don't you call it unclean. And so the Lord did this for him three times. So, so Peter needed to have this revelation three times. And I'm glad for that because I, I, I find myself in the same camp a lot of times. I need the Lord to tell me things over and over again so that they may sink down and be embedded in my heart and mind as to what he wants for my life. So as we look at this, Peter is uh, revealing this important truth to the other disciples who also were Jewish, and they were having a hard time. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want to back up just for a moment here, uh, this account of Peter. And I want you to back up just for a little bit here and notice verse 12. He's giving this account, and, uh, and, and he says, in, in, in fact, verse 12 says, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting, moreover these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter." who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as, he, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was, what was I that I could withstand God. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So they thought this was just a Jewish thing, and, and it was initially, but then the Lord intended to, for it to go out throughout to the whole world that all might know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior and have the forgiveness of their sins as well. So this was a brand new thought and an idea that Peter maybe never even contemplated. And I want to just stop and back up here just for a moment because to remind us that you and I also have thoughts about our relationship with the Lord and who God is to us and His direction for our life that we may have not even contemplated yet where the Lord wants to guide and lead us that we might experience Him to a greater fullness, to a greater experience. We do ourselves great harm if we feel that, that God has already revealed and given to us everything that we will ever have in our relationship with Him. May we realize that we serve an infinite God that wants us to continue to grow and become more like Him. So when we realize that we are like Him and that we will never reach that on this side of eternity, there will always be room 
for growth. So as, as we consider the, the subject matter tonight, and that is being led by the Holy Spirit, and how that takes place, be reminded, this is only one lesson of, of many uh, that you might even hear, and even more importantly, that God will, will guide you in as you seek to walk with Him. So what's involved and what is needed um, in being led by the Holy Spirit? Well, again, let me just remind you, it's a willingness to follow the Lord that has to do with abiding in Christ. Walking with the Lord, again, needs to be something that's fluid because there are truths that have not been revealed to us because we're not in a place to receive them as of, as of yet. And maybe we are now where we weren't maybe some years ago. And probably one of the greatest hindrances to a forward progression in our walk with the Lord is coming to the conclusion again that we've, we already know everything that we need to know about our relationship with the Lord. And that's going to hinder our growth. So the process of spiritual growth, we'll look at that tonight. And, uh, and two main thoughts primarily this evening uh, concerning spiritual growth, is, and that is number one, some things are for us to decide by God's grace, and, and I'll explain that here as we move along, and many things God has commanded us to walk in, again, by God's grace. So those are going to be the main two thoughts in the subject matter of being led by the Holy Spirit. There are some areas that, that, were, that are left open for you and I and the Lord by the grace of God to consider our personal convictions, but then there are things that God has laid out that he says, these are the things that I definitely want in your life and in your relationship with, with me. So following God is what we're going to do and, and, and look at tonight concerning the Holy Spirit and following God into areas that we've never been before. That's, that's an important truth to understand that God has things for us to experience that we have not experienced as of yet. So is our heart, let me ask you this question, is our heart in a place to grow? And this question is not just for church members, but it's for everybody who serves the Lord Jesus Christ. You might hold a position in, in the church, uh, but I want to remind you, listen, church position, no matter what it might be, does not guarantee faithfulness to the Lord. You can occupy any position or any office in the local New Testament church, and that will not necessarily mean that you are faithful to the Lord or growing in His grace and experiencing and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is required? Our heart must be in the place to serve the Lord with the unleavened bread of sincerity. What, what does that mean? In other words, we are not hiding or harboring or excusing ourselves to allow things into our life that God says he wants rooted out. And we'll look at that a little bit more as, as we move forward. But I want us to notice something here concerning spiritual growth. And, and that is, again, that it requires that we know two truths. And the first one is that some things are for us to decide by God's grace. They're never for us to decide all by ourselves but they are for us to decide by the grace of God. And let me explain that. Let me invite you over to the book of Romans, chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And I want to begin in verse 1 here. And these are the things that God has, has given to us um, to consider and to apply to our life. And what I mean by considering that we look at that, God does not force us to serve him. He wants us to do that of our own free will. He wants us to say, yes, Lord, I want to walk in your ways. I don't want to lean into my thinking and my understanding. I want to look to your word for guidance. And so he's going to give us some instructions here in the book of Romans chapter 14, verse 1. And here's what we find. He says, him that is weak in faith, Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. So not, in other words, you're not going to debate uh, this person's spirituality because, first of all, they are not our servants. They are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody, and especially as a pastor, God has allowed me to be the under-shepherd to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ that they might understand the word of God to hear God's will for their own personal life. So he says if, if they're weak in their faith, receive them. If they make a profession in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, receive them. And by the way, listen, just because somebody has been saved for a number of years, it does not necessarily mean that they have grown in the grace of God. They might have head knowledge, but listen, the, the fruits that they bear, you will be able to see. And by the way, they're not really for us to, to inspect. 
uh, because God still wants us to be gentle and kind and to encourage all the believers that God has placed into our life, whether, whether we're a church member, whether we teach a Sunday school class, whether we work a bus route, whether whatever our ministry might be that God has called us to, God wants us to be gentle and encouraging to bring others to the Lord or encourage them in the Lord that he might build his local New Testament church. So he says, those that are weak in the faith, and you, if you, however you might want to define that, uh, again, I would always encourage you to ask the Lord to define that. What, is, what does it mean to be weak in faith? And, and we want to build them. He says, verse 2, For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. So he's saying there's, there's a distinction here. They've come to these conclusions, and it may be because of certain information that they have received as they study the Word of God, or a lack of information that has brought them to that conclusion. And so God says, be patient with them. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. And this, is, this scripture is for all of God's people. And he says this, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So he says, this is, this is not our place to judge the position. We don't know everything that is happening in the life of an individual. And, and God's the one that, that makes that call. And God is the one that judges and speaks to the heart and encourages. Uh, we're just to simply be the encouragement in, in the word of God to point them to the Lord, not to judge them and to cause them to not want to serve the Lord. So verse 5, one man esteemeth uh, one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. But he says this, let every man, that's everyone, every mankind, that's every individual, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. See, listen, I can tell you things from the word of God but God needs to bring you to that place to where you are at home, where you can say, amen, I see that, I understand that. And the reason that I'm saying that is because I can, I can tell you some things, and, and you might say, okay, I'll, I'll adopt those convictions or, or those ideas, and that may be okay for a while, but they need to be your own personal convictions in order for you to stand. In other words, you need to know for certain what God is saying in his word and you, that you see it clearly where it makes sense to where it becomes yours. It's not just something, and, and I would encourage you to, to adopt uh, and to hold to the things that your pastor is, is teaching and, and preaching to you that you might, um, until you come to that place to where God brings it to you, but um, to, to where it's your own, but you do have to, Seek the Lord personally in order for that to be your conviction or your truth and, and your um, truth that God has revealed to you. So he says, verse 6, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And notice he says, he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. And giveth God thanks. So these are areas here that the Lord has given to us um, a personal, as we seek the Lord and his grace, direction that is specifically for us. It does not make one better or, or, or uh, less important than the other. These are just personal convictions that God has given to us freedom. And we all have different ideas, different thoughts, different, different strengths and different weaknesses. Uh, some people may not have a problem with certain things uh, that are not sinful. And yet those things, those very same things that are not sinful could cause somebody to go in a wrong direction. Let me just kind of give you um, a, a case in point. Uh, I like to watch sports. I'm not a sports fan. But if sports were to lead you down a path where you would give up the things of God and be unfaithful to the house of God because of sports, and unfortunately it seems like a lot of games, uh, whether it be baseball or, or, or football, a lot of the big professional games um, are on a Sunday. 
And not that you can't watch them in between and, and those things, but some people may be given to that to where it might. And I'm just mentioning a, a, a light thing here that might lead them in the wrong direction. Some, some, some individuals might say, you know, that's something that, that would cause my heart to, get in, to go into a wrong direction. Maybe some people might have in the past, when it comes to sports, have gambled on those things. And maybe that might tempt them to get back into, into gambling. So let's just kind of consider that just for a moment. Again, are sports bad? No, not, not necessarily. They're, they're not bad. Um, but maybe somebody's coming out of a lifestyle where they gambled on sports and that would just draw them closer to it and they would just say, you know, for me, it's better that I stay away from that so that I don't fall back into, my, into a worse situation, back into my old lifestyle and draw away from the Lord and get caught up into things that would be a, a detriment to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life and to my own personal life. And so that might be an area, just for example's sake, of where one individual is okay with, with certain things that are not sinful. Now, this is what we're talking about. These are things that God has not said specifically, clearly in his word, that these things are wrong and not right. So verse 7, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. And so that's where the phrase has probably come up with the, you know, the idea that no man is an island to himself. We all have an influence uh, on other people. And so God wants us to be a positive influence for his honor and glory. Then he says this in verse 8, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. And I just want to stop right there again, just making mention of this, that concerning spiritual growth, it requires that we are able to make this decisions concerning specific and certain things by the grace of God. Even these things that we might consider to be um, something that, that are not, some, the things that are not sinful, everything that we do, we should always couple with the idea that we will go before the Lord and say, Lord, is this your direction? Is this all right um, in my life? Especially if we have any concerns or questions, um, it would be a good thing for us to decide, to, to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to make this decision. So again, there are certain things that, that God has allowed us to make some decisions on concerning our walk with him and what we do for the Lord. And if, we're, and if God has called us to do certain things for him or not to do certain things for him uh, that, are, that are not spelled out in Scripture, we still need to make sure that we seek the Lord in those things and allow the Lord and ask God to guide us with his Holy Spirit in making those decisions. And some people might say, oh, well, maybe that's not that important. Listen, everything in our life, for the Lord Jesus Christ is important. So again, some things are for us to decide by God's grace. And then the, the, the last point out of the two tonight, many things that God has commanded us uh, to walk in by his grace. He's not asking us. He has commanded us to do for his honor and glory. And with that said, I want to call you over to the Gospel of John for a moment. Chapter 15 and verse 5. The Gospel of John, chapter verse, uh, sorry, chapter 15, verse 5. And this is something that God has commanded us to do. This is not a, a request or a recommendation. This is a commandment uh, when, when he says, this is what you're to do. So verse 5, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, as we look at this, he wants us to abide in him. This is what's important. He, he has spelled that out in the previous chapter, in chapter 14. And he says, this is how the Lord will manifest and reveal himself and empower our lives to fulfill his will for our lives, that we might enjoy and experience the power and grace of God in us for his glory, our blessing, and to point others to him. And so again, as we consider this, he's saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to abide in me. And he spelled this out. He said, he said, if you don't abide in me, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to bear fruit. What's it going to be like if you choose not to seek to abide in the Lord? And that's a personal pursuit that God brings us to. Listen, tonight, as we look at this, that might make sense to a certain degree, but God has to give us the revelation 
that we might understand that the light bulb might come on on what he's talking about abiding. And, and maybe if that hasn't happened yet, that will happen here tonight. Let me show you verse 6 in what he says here. He says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. You know, in, in the years that, that I have served the Lord, there's been a lot of discussion on that one verse, and people have questioned that and said, well, does that mean that the fellow was never saved or that they lost their salvation? Well, I want to remind you, he's speaking to his disciples. He's not addressing the lost here. He's addressing those that are saved. And so I, I think a better understanding is this is what it's like for somebody an indication of somebody that's not abiding in me. Their, their life is, is burned up. They're, they're, they're a branch that's withered. And they're, they're really good for nothing but to be thrown into the fire. In other words, what are you saying? It's a wasted life. Because God has enabled the believer to bear a lot of fruit. The key, though, is that we must abide in the Lord. We cannot bear fruit of ourselves. And so the idea, I believe, is more of an illustration to the disciples that if you don't abide in the Lord, then you're going to have a barren life and you're not going to be very productive. And so when we consider what abiding in Christ is all about, that's more important, I believe, and, this is, and I'm just giving you my, my personal uh, conjecture here, that that's more important than the things that you do physically for the Lord. Because if you're, in, if you're abiding in the Lord, you're in sync, you're in tune with his direction for your life. It is possible and unfortunately probable that a lot of people serve the Lord with the exteriors. And I am talking about people who have trusted the Lord as their savior, but they're kind of like in an automatic mode. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm not supposed to do. And that's all right, but that's not, that's not where we abide and where the fruit of the Lord is expressing itself because then we become self-reliant on what we do and what we ought to be doing. Is, is obedience important? Yes, o obedience is very important, but it must be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we're just obeying because these are the things that we're supposed to do, I promise you it won't be very long before you become disgruntled and before you lose interest and excitement in your relationship with the Lord because we're not experiencing the power of God the way that he wants us. We're not connected. We, we are his child, but we're not experiencing the grace of God that bears his fruit. And, and we'll see that here in just a moment as we, as we move a little bit further. So fruitfulness really is equated with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And, and you can look at that in the book of Galatians chapter 5, and, you, and you'll see those fruits of the Spirit and the, the, the gentleness, the kindness, the meekness, the love of God. If that is absent, then you're missing out, as a, as a saved child of God, you're missing out on God's plan. You can do all the exteriors, but if you don't have the grace of God... You're going to grow weary in well-doing because it's not energized by the Holy Spirit. It's something that you're doing in the flesh, in the strength of the flesh, and not by the power and grace of the Lord. Um, is, is it important to see people saved? Absolutely. But God wants you first to walk with Him, to experience Him, so that when you speak the Word of God, people will see Him and, and, and not you, and not just, what, not just a good idea but then the power of the Holy Spirit is at work, and that's where real conviction will, will come in. So God wants us to be tapped into his life source that we might share that life source with others. Uh, for example, William Carey was in, 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 um, in, in India for some seven years before he baptized his first convert. And that was a long time. He had, he had ministered the word of God. He had worked among, among the people. And it was, a, it was a very difficult time. But through all of that, <clears throat> the, the people were watching the grace of God in his life. And they saw that what he was offering was real. And that was important. Because those who are willing to leave 
their Hindu religion, the, their families would turn on them. And they would be rejected from their own families. And a, 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 some of them that he was ministering to were killed, were martyred. Because they had taken on this new religion and rejected theirs. And so it was so important for them. It was a life and death matter at, at, at the most. And at the least, it would cause them to lose relationships, family and friends. So before they made this kind of a decision, they were really evaluating if what he said was really the truth. Today, <clears throat> I'm afraid that... Um, Many people are easily offended because <clears throat> maybe they don't, they don't want to accept what we're offering right off the bat. But I think what's important is that they see, not me, but the grace of God has revealed that God wants us to be transformed to his likeness, a living sacrifice, and that's going to be a better testimony than anything we can ever do in our own strength. We are to witness and we are to share the gospel but it must be coupled with the Holy Spirit or there'll be a missing ingredient and it will, it will, you're going you're to get people that will not last. They're going to they're jump into an idea with, without the relationship or without the power of God and, and they're not going to last. So God wants them to experience His grace personally because He's the best motivator. We will never, in our own strength and ideas, mo motivate people like the Lord can. So... What is it? Let me ask you this question tonight. What is it actually, um, or what specifically will it be in, in your life and mine that will honor the Lord? Will it be what we do for the Lord, or will it be what He will do for us? Well, let's, let's look here a little bit and notice what, what the Lord says here. Look at verse 7. He says, if ye abide in me... And my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Notice this. Herein, verse 8, is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now, we limit it if all we think it is is just, is just reaching people for the Lord. It goes much further than that. It is, it is our connection with our God. It, the fruit that he is implying here. Does it, will it include the salvation of, of people? Yes, absolutely. I'm convinced of that. But I think maybe even more important is that we become transformed to the image of Christ. And that's his work. We cannot do that ourselves. And he's going to lay that out here. He, he's going to let us understand that the love of God is key ingredient to what he wants us to experience. Because without the love of God... Basically, there's no gospel. So what kind of love is it that Jesus has? Uh, is it not unconditional? Let me ask you, what kind of love do you have toward all the members in your church? That's important. I, I, listen, I, I've, unfortunately, I've been in churches where, where people have, were at odds for years uh, with each other. And that doesn't glorify the Lord. Um, God wants us to love all of the members in his local New Testament church. Let me ask you this. What kind of love do you have toward all the members in your family? That would be a horrible testimony to, to say, you know, yeah, I'm a servant of the Lord, but I don't love all of my family. I, I, don't, I don't respect all of my family. I'm, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't really like all of my family. There's a problem there. Because the love of God, if it's in us, it should be spread abroad to everybody. It, it's, not, it's, it's no respecter of persons, the love of God. The love of God, Jesus Christ, did not die for a certain group and not for the other. He died for the whole world. That's the love of God. What kind of love does God want you to have toward both? All your church members, your family, and the whole world. And of course you know it is unconditional. So our heart must be in the place to serve the Lord with the unleavened bread of sincerity. That means we're not being deceptive. We're not reinterpreting. We're not hiding things. We're not saying, oh yeah, everything's all right when, it's really, when it really isn't. We're, we're wanting to do business with the Lord. The word sincerity, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh, but they would have porcelain goods and uh, back during the, the days of the Corinthian 
um, markets and things of that nature, and and they would be they would make these uh, these vases or vases, what vases, whatever you want to call them, different porcelain goods, and sometimes they would crack under the stress of, of the heating process, and, and what they would do is they would put wax in there. Well, a lot of times these vendors, they were just coming through and going by, and they would sell their wares and, and move to another location, and so they could sell uh, faulty goods, porcelain goods, and the buyer may not even realize it. Of course, if you, had a, if you had a specific booth where you were in the same place the whole time, you certainly would not want to be dishonest and be found out. What would happen is they would bring this porcelain good at home and after some washing and some heating to it, they would, they would fill the cracks wherever ever there might be a leak with wax. And that's what the word sincere means. It means without wax. In other words, it's, it's a genuine article that is not faulty. And so... If, if it was faulty and they had tried to hide it with the wax, then before long the leak would be there and they would be able to see that it, that it was covered up. And so more importantly, where we live, where, where our church home is and amongst our family, it needs to be without wax. It needs to be genuine and upfront and sincere. And we need to make sure that all of our relationships are right especially if, if, uh, if there's a problem that we would pursue that and make sure that that would be resolved, that there would be no issue. And you're going to see the importance of that. Um, and so many people, it's so easy to overlook and just kind of just sweep things under the rug and not deal with them and, and not, not try to mend things that God would have us to mend. And, um, and, and that would hinder and grieve the Holy Spirit. Again, remember, God is no respecter of persons. Every person that is, a, that is a, a saved child of God is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit knows if there's a problem there. And, and that grieves him that we're not willing to, to resolve the issue with whatever it takes. Again, calling upon the Lord to enable us to, to resolve relationships. Now, notice what, what he says here. Look at verse 8 again. Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Disciples, Look look what the Lord does here, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, this is what the Lord is speaking about. So have I loved you, continue ye in my what? In the love, in the love of God, in his love. And so there are a lot of commandments that we can do. And notice what the Lord says right here in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Lord is bringing out to the disciples that, that love is the key ingredient, paramount. Why? Because it was the love of God in the first place that caused him to give, to give his son. The, listen, the, 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 the bond of the relationship that we have with the Lord is the love of God. If that love is not through and through genuine, we are deceiving ourselves and we are missing out on what God wants us to experience, and we will truly be grieving the Holy Spirit. You can dress it up and you can cover it up on the outside, but when you stand before the Lord, you will realize that you missed the greatest need in the life of the believer, and that is to open up to the love of God and to allow Him. Listen, the love of God requires true humility because every believer has been at fault to one extent or the other. And we have to be willing to say, I am sorry in all genuine, in all genuine sincerity, sincerity, not covering it up. I really, I'm not, I'm not just saying words because I'm supposed to with the idea of, oh, I'm sorry, I got that over with. No, I really want to restore. I want to cultivate a relationship. I'm not just doing what I'm supposed to doing. And I'm afraid a lot of people can get caught up in that as a child of God. They are just doing what they are supposed to be doing, and the love of God is absent. And so notice what he says here. The Lord's speaking to his disciples. If you keep my commandments, in verse 10, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So it's the, the coupling there that is holding all this together is the love of God. That is the abiding part. If the love of God is absent there, 
there's no way that you're going to be abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just not going to happen. And your life is going to be something in the eyes of God as a branch that is withered. And it's good for nothing. He's not talking about losing your salvation or not being saved. He's just talking about the illustration. It's, it's, it's worthless. It not, does not have the value. There are people that are cherishing things that God says are, are, are not good but to be burned. There are people that are holding on to things and missing out to hold on to their branches that are withered and, and not having the grace or power of God the way he would have that to take place. So he's, he's talking about the things that, that he's spoken to us. He's talking about our joy being full. And then verse 12, he says this, this is my commandment. Now listen, he says, you need to walk in my commandments, but now he makes, he simplifies it. Watch this, ready? This is my commandment that you love one another. I didn't say that. The Lord did. He says that you love one another. How? As I have loved you with no strings. That's sincere. That's coming before the Lord and saying, you know what? I am, I am willing to do business with the Lord. In, in this sense, I am willing to open up every area of my life and say, Lord, it's all yours. Again, you can get caught up in doing different things, but if the love of God is not paramount in your life, in, in all genuine truth, the only one that's being deceived is the individual that's harboring those things. So he says, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Then he says this, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And we know the Lord was getting ready to do that. He says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He says, do the commandments, but what was the main thing that he said, that what was the main commandment that he wanted them to do, that you love one another? Why? Listen, the love of God hinges everything else that we do for him. If the love of God is absent, I'm afraid we're not doing much for the Lord. Not what he wants. We are offering him something that he did not require. You cannot faithfully serve the Lord without the love of God. And, 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 the, and the word of God is specifically clear. So Jesus names this specific commandment for every believer. Other, otherwise, all that we do for the Lord, I'm afraid, will be wasted, will be burned up. He, he's saying, look, if, if you're not abiding in me, then your life is going to be withered up and, and, and not good for much. And all that you do will be wood, hay, and stubble for the Lord. So he says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And, and what, was the, what was the thing that he commanded in verse 12? That you love one another. And then he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, physically speaking, that's talking about physical death. But it's also talking about dying to self. That we might, that we might truly restore and, and love like the Lord does. Now, not everybody's going to receive that. And what I mean by that is we may genuinely want to restore relationships. And it's not ours to decide, but we, we, want, we want to do everything that we can to make sure that we've allowed that individual to know, whoever has wronged us or whoever we have wronged, to know that, that we want a loving relationship with them. If they choose to reject that, that is between them and the Lord if they're a child of God. We cannot force that, but we do want to make sure that we have made the way to let them know that, that we want to do the, the right thing. We want to make sure that that relationship is, is restored as much as lies on our side. Now, why is all this so important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me invite you over to the book of 1 Corinthians just for a moment. Uh, I'm afraid some people make, make light of the love of God and the importance of it. And I've shared this um, not too long ago, but I want to remind us, as, especially as, as we move into the Resurrection Sunday, especially as we, as we prepare to rejoice, reflect, and remember what the Lord has given to us in our eternal life, and as we, we praise Him for that, uh, may we be in His Spirit, which is, which is the love of God, the unconditional love of the Lord. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Verse 2 says this, And though I have the gift of prophecy, preaching the word of God, 
and understand all mysteries. Oh, I can tell you the book of Revelation. I can tell you uh, all, all about the book of Ezekiel. And I'm going to tell you all these things that God has given to me. I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And he, said, and he says, and though I have all faith, what kind of faith? So that I can remove mountains. I can do some great things. And Paul says, and have not charity. Paul says, I am nothing. So love is very important to the child of God in our relationship to the Lord. Paul is allowing us to understand we can have, look, it appears to be here that people are functioning without the love of God from what Paul is saying. And yet he's saying, if you get caught up in all of that where you can do all of that and you don't have love, Paul is saying, if that was happening in my life, I want you to understand my value towards the kingdom of God my value concerning the gospel of God is nothing. I can explain all, all kinds of things. Listen, he was caught up into the third heaven. He could, he could explain some things uh, that he was allowed to explain to give some good clarity on, on what the Lord had revealed to him. But he even said, with that, if I don't have the love of God, I'm nothing. So in conclusion, let me, let me ask two questions that I believe have to be answered again with the unleavened bread of sincerity, without wax, no deception, are you willing to follow and abide in Christ? Is your walk with God fluid and growing closer in the Holy Spirit? If so, then you'll see the love of God is very prevalent, in fact, paramount. But if it's not taking place, we can ask the Lord, to give us a heart that hungers after his righteousness. Not what we think. Because a lot of people can do what they think is right in their own eyes and in their own heart. And miss the Lord completely. And as we saw here tonight, without the love of God, there's no abiding. And without the love of God, doesn't matter what you're doing. You're, you're, you're not going to be enjoying the grace of God. Because it, it will, it's there as far as a saved child of God. But we will be missing on the relationship with our God and with one another that He wants us to have. If our relationship, and that, that symbolizes the cross, does it not? If our relationship is really right with the Lord on the vertical, then the horizontal with, with mankind, with our family and our church family and the world will be right as well. So tonight, as we consider being led by the Holy Spirit, is that taking place in your life? And again, if not, God says, call on me. I have things to show you that will awe you. And it's just for the asking, as long as we walk with a humble heart and say, yes, Lord, I need you in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. Again, Lord, we thank you for your truths and how you guide and direct our lives that we might experience you in a great way and that our families would be blessed and our church families and in ultimately the whole world that we might share the gospel message, the love of God to a lost and dying world that needs the Lord as their Savior. Bless, Lord, Northwood Baptist Church and all your churches tonight, all the members, of course, of Northwood Baptist Church and all the members of your other local New Testament churches. Build us, Lord, for your honor and glory. And we'll praise and thank you, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.